Prostate cancer is the most common type of cancer experienced by men. It's also very curable. Thanks to new advances in science and treatments, more men are surviving prostate cancer than ever before. The world-renowned prostate cancer team at the University of Chicago Medicine is highly skilled in the most up-to-date technology for the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. Today on the program, we will talk about clinical trials and various treatment options. We'll discuss the launch of our high-risk and advanced prostate cancer clinic. We will also learn about genetic predispositions and what you need to be aware of. We will introduce you to one of our patients who found he had prostate cancer, went through treatment, and now lives a very active, healthy life. All of this coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And welcome to At The Forefront Live. Over the next half hour, we will take your questions live. So start typing in the comment section. We'll get to as many as possible. We want to remind everyone that today's broadcast is not designed to take the place of a consultation with your physician. Now, joining me today in our first segment are physicians Russell Smulowitz and Stanley Liao. In our second segment, we'll have physician Scott Egner and genetic counselor Sarah Nielsen. They will be on the program to discuss more things involving prostate cancer. First, let's start off with the basics. Welcome to the program. We appreciate you being here. And please describe, if you can, prostate cancer. Exactly what is it and, and what kind of things do people need to be aware of and possibly look for? Go ahead. Let's start. Well, prostate cancer is a cancer that affects men. Uh, the prostate gland is considered a male sexual organ. The purpose of the prostate gland is to make some seminal fluid um, that's involved with sexual activity. So uh, what men need to know is that um, prostate cancer is very common. It's the most common uh, cancer that affects men in the United States. It affects about one in seven men. Um, there are screening tests available for it and is a very treatable condition with uh, good cure rates. And I think, uh, again, part of the key to this is, is early detection and, and early treatment, I would imagine, like with most cancers. That's correct. So can we talk a little bit about PSA tests? Because that's something that I think many of us have heard of and probably don't know exactly what that is. And Dr. Smilowitz, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so PSA test is a blood test. Uh, basically, it's a test that, you, that patients can get um, at their physician's visit. And it is a uh, protein that's made exclusively by prostate tissue. And it's made both by normal prostate and even to a greater extent by prostate cancer. And basically, it's one of the ways in which we can screen and, and detect for prostate cancer. Basically, there's a normal range for what a normal size prostate would make with respect to this PSA. And if it's elevated, that gives us a clue that perhaps we should do a biopsy to look for uh, prostate cancer within the gland itself. And if, if you do see those elevated rates, you, you mentioned the biopsy, and there are other uh, tests as well that uh, probably your physician will put you through if you are uh, in that category, correct? Sure. Um, it, screening for prostate cancer is controversial, but in addition to this PSA blood test, it would be standard to have a physical examination, including a, a digital rectal examination. And then if it is elevated, your primary care physician will likely send you to a urologist for a consultation that urologist might do other physical examination, might order a CT scan or MRI um, in addition to a biopsy. Now, I think uh, prostate cancer is more prevalent in men as they get a little bit older. Is, would, would that be a fair statement, I would think? And as people get older, what kind of things should they look for? What kind of things should they be aware of as you know, we experience changes? Uh, it is true that prostate cancer is more common with age. Um, some estimates are that it's as high as 70% in, in men who are age 80 and higher. Um, one thing about prostate cancer is that uh, PSA screening can be valuable because most men who are newly diagnosed don't have any symptoms. So there isn't necessarily uh, a set of symptoms that men should necessarily be looking out for related to having a cancer diagnosis. Now we, we already are getting questions from our viewers, which is great. We want to remind our viewers, please type in the comment section. We'll try to get to as many as your questions as we possibly can over the next half hour. Uh, the first one that we have is, I've heard that there are some e experimental treatments involving laser ablation of prostate tumors. Is this true and, and where does the treatment option stand in the continuum of care? So um, 
Dr. Agner, who will be speaking in the second segment uh, of, of this uh, Chicago Medicine at the Forefront Live, can speak more to this um, as he's been involved in the uh, development of this type of therapy. Great. But but basically, there are new technologies, including laser, that allow you to ablate a certain portion of the prostate, but not the entire prostate. And it's a device that has been cleared uh, for use, uh, but to be honest, the long-term results from a cancer standpoint are not entirely clear as of yet. Okay. So, so how dangerous is prostate cancer? One of the things that uh, I've seen actually online, that prostate cancer isn't fatal. And again, as I always say on the show, believe, you know, when, be careful with what you read on the, on the internet because it's not necessarily very accurate. So uh, can, you, can you address that uh, as how is the, the danger of prostate cancer? Sure. Um, well, we certainly see a spectrum with um, prostate cancer diagnoses. Fortunately, most men are diagnosed with low risk features. So a significant proportion of men may not actually need treatments and can go undergo something called active surveillance, whereby the disease is monitored with certain parameters. And when you get nervous about it progressing, uh, in accordance with a man's life expectancy, only then would you consider treatment. But we certainly do see the other uh, end of the spectrum, unfortunately, where men can present with very high risk features um, that can be lethal. Um, so it's important to get as much information as you can when you're diagnosed and make the appropriate treatment decisions uh, with all the information that you have available. And, and so to kind of go with what you were talking about earlier, uh, at the more at the beginning stage, you just kind of take, keep an eye on it and you watch it and make sure that it doesn't get worse and, and people can kind of go ahead with that? Is that how it works? Well, I, I would say that it, it, what Stan was mentioning is that there are features that we can really only tell by the biopsy that, and by perhaps the MRI and the total PSA that help us determine whether or not uh, the prostate cancer is a low risk prostate cancer or a higher risk prostate cancer. It is true that with lower risk prostate cancer, surveillance is very reasonable, but when you have higher risk features, which you can really only uh, tell from the biopsy, that is where uh, treatment is uh, likely necessary. Mm -hmm. and, and what types of, of treatments are we talking about at that point? Well, men who present with higher risk features that uh, therapy is warranted for will often consider two of the mainstays of local therapy, and that would be surgery or radical prostatectomy and radiation therapy, which comes in two forms, external beam radiation and prostate seed uh, brachytherapy or, or HDR brachytherapy. Um, so these are probably the, the two most common um, uh, therapies with long-standing follow-up for men who have uh, higher risk features um, that haven't spread to other parts of the body. And can you kind of describe those therapies for us in, uh, in, in layman's terms, if, if at all possible? Sure. Uh, radical prostatectomy is a procedure where a urologic surgeon will uh, have the patient undergo general anesthesia and uh, do an operation to remove the prostate, seminal vesicles, and occasionally sample pelvic lymph nodes. Uh, the goal is to remove all of the areas that are at risk. Um, it does have favorable um, success rates and new technologies have allowed uh, functional outcomes to become better over time. Um, radiation therapy um, is another form of local treatment that has similar rates of cure. Uh, external beam treatment is usually done as an outpatient over several weeks of time where a patient will come Monday through Friday, lay on a table, and a machine called the linear accelerator will treat them with high energy x-rays that are painless. Um, the patient uh, undergoes the treatment in a matter of a few minutes each day and comes back uh, repeatedly um, and is, is followed for their PSA. The um, Prostate brachytherapy is another version of giving radiation using a radioactive source. In some cases, it's a seed implant um, to give low-dose uh, implants or brachytherapy, and in some cases, it can be a high-dose rate exposure. Um, this is usually done uh, under anesthesia uh, in our university. It's done in conjunction with our urology colleagues, um, and a uh, patient wakes up and is done with the treatment, and, and we surveil them. And, and these are, are pretty targeted uh, treatments, correct? They are targeted treatments. So, because yes. uh, I think that's a lot of times people get worried when they, when they hear radiation and things like that. And, and with today's technology and, and the advances that have been made, uh, that's, you, you want to pe put people's mind at ease when you talk about things like that. So the, the targeted treatments are obviously important. Absolutely. You know, one of the goals uh, in radiation oncology is to treat the area of uh, disease that's uh, only at risk and try to minimize the amount of normal tissues and 
We take uh, great care to try to use our technology in order to do that. And Dr. Smolowitz, it's amazing how things have changed over the years with technology like that to, to make that possible because I think, you know, if, if you went back a decade or two, it was, it was a very different story. Well, you know, it's, it's an exciting time for medical care in general and for uh, cancer care specifically. And in, and in prostate cancer, uh, we do have um, newer technologies, including uh, robots that can help our surgeons operate with less uh, side effects and with a shorter hospital stay and with radiation techniques that allow more precision and uh, allow the normal tissues around the prostate to be, to be spared. So it, it definitely, and, and these technologies keep getting better and, and better and we pride ourselves at being at the, at the leading edge of that. Perfect. Who is the most at risk for uh, prostate cancer? Well, men. Men are more at risk than women. Um, <laughs> Makes sense. Other than it is more common with age, so yeah. the older you get, the more at risk you mm -hmm. are. I would say um, some of the major risk factors are a family history. So if you have a first degree relative with prostate cancer, you're at much higher risk. If, um, other cancers also co-segregate with prostate cancer. So if you have a strong family history of, for example, breast cancer or ovarian cancer, then you may be at increased risk for prostate cancer. And we'll get to some of the genetics of that in the second segment. And then finally, it, it's, it is worth pointing out that uh, African American men are at much higher risk for prostate cancer than uh, Caucasian men. And that's interesting. I'm sure there have been plenty of studies done trying to determine why that is, but uh, certainly a, a valuable piece of information. At, at what age, if you do have some of these, uh, some of these factors, do you, do you get screened? Do you get tested? Is that something you do when you're 50? I know there's a bit of a, a bit of controversy around uh, screening for, for prostate cancer. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we can go on all day if you want to, but... Uh, no. Dan, you want to? Yeah, it is, it is a controversy. Um, uh, I, I think uh, most people would agree that shared decision making is uh, the right avenue to take, which means that a patient and a physician, which is usually a primary care physician, will have a discussion about the benefits and risks of PSA screening. Um, but there are studies that show that there are benefits to PSA screening, which means that you can uh, save lives, uh, especially in the age ranges of 55 to 74. Uh, but I think it's appropriate to have these discussions earlier, especially if you have, especially if you have risk factors in a family history. So talk to your physician. That's probably the best piece of advice uh, from that standpoint. We've got another question from a viewer asking how long are the radiation treatments? Does it depend on the severity of the prostate cancer? How long do they go on? Uh, yes, it, it really does depend on the, um, the characteristics of the cancer and also on the health of the patients involved. Uh, but um, there have been some recent trials that have shown that giving shorter courses of radiation are actually uh, very safe uh, compared to the historical standards, which would give men eight to nine weeks of radiation treatment. Uh, so it really depends on the situation, but um, we've adopted shorter courses, and four weeks is a very common uh, length of time for men who have intact prostate cancer. What are some of the current innovations that uh, you're seeing take place in, in the treatment of prostate cancer? So uh, I'll speak to the innovations for uh, therapy once the disease is spread. Unfortunately, that, I that is a common occurrence, especially for the more aggressive disease. And the patients that I treat in my clinic um, have disease that, that has spread. And I would say that over the last 10 years, we've really seen an explosion of new medications to uh, subdue and to treat that advanced, uh, what we call metastatic prostate cancer. We've, uh, there have been very exciting treatments in novel hormonal therapies that are both well tolerated and, and very, very effective. We have new immune therapies that are FDA approved for prostate cancer. Um, and we have new combinations of therapy. And I, so I think that one of the greatest innovations is that we're realizing that the earlier we treat prostate cancer with more aggressive therapies, uh, the better our chances of success are. You know, we were talking a little bit before the program, and one of the things that I think makes uh, U Chicago Medicine very special is the clinical trials. I mean, we do a lot of a lot of work here that's unique because we are a, a research institution and a university that also, you know, couples with a hospital on on work like this, and and I think that is a, a huge advantage to the patient. And can you speak to, a little bit to that? And what do the clinical trials mean, and how how important is that for the patient? Sure. Um, so thank you for that question. So uh, clinical trials 
is, is a blanket term and there are multiple different kinds of clinical trials. What we're talking about is a way to advance the field of prostate cancer through research. And we pride ourselves on having clinical research opportunities for our patients throughout the course of their disease. We have uh, clinical research trials that patients can participate in even before they're diagnosed, when they're at risk and we think that they may have prostate cancer, we have biomarker-based studies, so studies looking at the diagnosis and trying to refine the diagnosis. Then we have clinical trials that are testing new therapeutics for early disease, for disease that recurs, for advanced disease, and, and we're really talking about having a clinical trial opportunity that will push the field forward for all of the patients, no matter where they are in their disease spectrum when they come to see us. Great. Dr. Leal, we have a question from a, a viewer, and it is, what are the options for someone if the cancer actually does indeed return, which I'm sure is a, a, a common fear for people? Sure. Uh, it, it does happen, unfortunately, um, but there are a lot of treatments, some of them very effective. Uh, it really depends on the circumstance. For men who have surgery and then have a PSA rise, it is common for us to see them and think about doing radiation treatment just because the source of the PSA recurrence is most commonly within the pelvis, and that is an area that we can uh, fairly safely treat with uh, external beam radiation. So um, there are also other types of recurrences, of course. Um, those that occur after radiation or external beam radiation can sometimes be salvaged with surgery or repeat radiation. And then, of course, there's a lot of systemic therapies um, that Dr. Smolowitz and his colleagues would administer for people who might have uh, metastatic recurrence. Uh, more and more, we're, we're seeing that aggressive treatments to metastatic sites, especially if there are um, very few of them, may actually help to um, improve outcomes. So um, we are interested in that at the University of Chicago to try to extend the use of our therapies for more advanced disease. Fantastic. I'm excited. We get to meet one of your patients here right now. Uh, Dave Hicks is a triathlete who has always kept himself in good shape. He was surprised when he found out that he had prostate cancer after treatment at U Chicago Medicine. Dave is proof that prostate cancer doesn't have to slow you down. It was a surprise to me. I uh, never had a clue that I had uh, any kind of condition going on. I was doing fine, went in for an executive physical and uh, just as part of the normal screening process. That's just sobering. <laughs> just look at a life and suddenly being faced with something that has a potential to, you know, impact your future in such a significant way. We immediately kind of connected in terms of his uh, uh, triathlon experience and everything. And he just struck me as a very sharp, outstanding uh, physician who uh, covered all the bases and had uh, excellent answers and seemed to be right up to date current on research and clinical studies. So I, I was very impressed. Uh, you know, there's really a um, couple goals as we go through treatment, but the, the main two are that uh, we hope that the disease doesn't come back, that it's successful to eradicate any uh, cells uh, of activity, and the second is to try to protect the normal tissues so that patients can maintain a high quality of life in the long run. Uh, radiation for prostate is uh, typically done using linear accelerators. Um, courses of treatment usually last for several weeks at a time. Uh, in Dave's case, it was about eight and a half weeks. I started to feel the effects of the radiation therapy just in the last few weeks before the marathon. I mean, I could just watch my performance deteriorate, and it dropped off by 20% over a year uh, period of time there. And, and I gained weight. I gained like 40 pounds. It significantly affected training and affected my, my races. I mean, it became a, a focus of, well, you know, I'll just finish the race and keep keep going and keep doing the exercise and everything, but uh, certainly the fact that you continue to stay exercising and doing strength training uh, is a huge help. It means that uh, patients are also more invested in their outcomes and that's always a great thing. Uh, you have a sense that you'll have an easier time getting people through treatment when they're invested.
So I mean, that certainly uh, was a, a big win and uh, felt good that I uh, had uh, achieved another milestone. Uh, yeah, we're, we're pleased with how Dave's done. Uh, it's a testament to uh, himself to uh, really try to keep his body in, in great shape and uh, be very fit because I think that does play a part in his ability to recover well from the treatment. Dave is a, is a special guy. Mental standpoint, this isn't a death sentence. This isn't a, you know the end of you know my uh, current kind of view on things. This is just another speed bump in life, and uh, we'll get over it. That was a nice story, and it's good to see that he's he's doing so well. So joining us for our second segment of the program is Dr. Scott Egner and genetic counselor Sarah Nielsen. Welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. So let's just talk, uh, let's jump right into it, and I think people are kind of curious, the big question, and this was asked earlier as well, is how, how critical is genetic history or hereditary, uh, heredity when we talk about prostate cancer? Because I think we see this in, in a lot of diseases, in particular cancers. Yeah, so we know that uh, prostate cancer is one of the most familial diseases, meaning that it, it runs in families often, and we're now starting to pay more attention to the particular genes we can test for um, that are related to hereditary or genetic prostate cancer. Uh, so family history is definitely one of the big um, parts of uh, determining what people's risk for prostate cancer is, and could they potentially carry one of these uh, genetic causes are one of these genes that we'll, we'll talk about as well. So if you do have a family history, would you suggest that uh, somebody get tested a, at a specific age or what would you what would you tell them? Either one of you can jump in on that one. Yeah, that's very actionable information and there's very strict criteria on who might benefit from genetic testing. But in essence, it could directly benefit that man in how we decide to screen aggressively or loosely it can often alter the management options if he is diagnosed with prostate cancer. And then what most people don't realize is if a man has an identifiable genetic mutation, it can have profound impact on other family members, siblings, parents, children, both males and females. So it's in incredibly important, and that's why we're fortunate to have Sarah and her team to, uh, to at our disposal. Can you talk to us a little bit about the program here at U Chicago Medicine? Because this is, is very interesting to me. You know, if you if you have again the family history, people I think are, and very understandably, they're concerned. So, talk to us a little bit about the program and how you uh, deal with and treat uh, patients or prospective patients as they come in. Yeah, the good news for people that might be at risk for prostate cancer or are diagnosed with prostate cancer is we have a really comprehensive team of folks all with their special area of expertise that have spent most of their adult life learning about prostate cancer. So it's really comprehensive, really multidisciplinary. There's a few of us on the urologic oncology side. We have a couple folks on the radiation oncology side, a number on medical oncology. We have Sarah Nielsen and her team in genetic counseling. We have some world-class radiologists, pathologists, and we'll basically pull in anyone, including scientists and clinical trialists, to try to do everything possible to provide for patients. You know, and I'm glad you're, you brought that up and you're talking about that because one of the things that I've seen time and time again as I do this program for you, Chicago Medicine, is that this team approach when it comes to dealing with patients. And I think this is so important and it's such a, a, a benefit to the patient because we do have experts across many, many fields and world-renowned experts. So it, it really is, a, it's, it's, in my opinion, the way to get care. And I think it's the way to do it. And, and you guys do a wonderful job of it. Yeah, and one of the things we're recently very enthusiastic about is we had a very generous but anonymous donor give us a large chunk of money to start what's called the UCHAP clinic, UCHAP, which is the University of Chicago High Risk and Advanced Prostate Cancer Clinic. And to your point, it's a multidisciplinary approach where we meet from multiple different disciplines all in one clinic setting. Mm -hmm. And it's a genetic counselor, a urologic oncologist, a medical oncologist, a radi radiation oncologist if needed. And men can, sometimes they come in and they need only one or two of us, sometimes they would see all of us, but it's sort of one-stop shopping for screening and treatment for what can often be a complex and, and worrisome situation. And I can also just add Absolutely. that we, so um, we do get an extensive family history for every patient we see pretty much. Um, and so that's kind of part of the package too, is a personalized risk assessment. Um, 
like we talked about, not just asking about prostate cancer in the family, but asking about breast, ovarian, pancreatic, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, all these components of a uh, risk assessment to decide if that patient should go through with genetic testing. And um, the process of that is not as scary as it sounds. It's essentially just a, a simple blood draw, but we do spend some time uh, talking with the patient at that time to talk about the implications for both themselves and their family members. Um, so the clinic allows us to have that conversation in conjunction with the conversation with the rest of the physicians as well. And, and that's very interesting. Can you expand a little bit on the, the genetic testing? Because obviously it would, you know, I, I can see the impact that if I went in for it, potentially on me, but for family members as well, how important is that for, for children, right. uh, other family members? Right, so once we, once we identify, or if we do identify a genetic cause, it allows us to do um, targeted testing for other family members. So if we can determine what's causing the cancer in that family, then when we can use that genetic information to determine who in the family's at risk and who actually may not be at as high risk anymore. Um, and like we also mentioned earlier, it's not just prostate cancer, we can also um, assess risk for women in the family. The highest risks um, when we talk about the most common genes for prostate cancer are BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are historically known as the uh, genes we would test for women for breast and ovarian cancer, the BRCA genes or the Angelina Jolie genes as, mm -hmm. as we've heard them. Yeah. There's some rebranding re to do if we should be <laughs> calling them the breast ovarian prostate genes. but. Um, and so those genes actually have the highest risk for breast and ovarian cancer in women. Um, and in terms of ages, we start um, thinking about testing. I think you had asked that earlier, what age yeah. should we do testing? Um, these are, are adult onset cancers, so we, don't, are, we are not typically testing children. We think about young adulthood, um, primarily the early or mid-20s for women and for men. Um, if they do carry these higher risk genes, we, st we talk about screening their prostate around age 40. Well, that, that is great information because I think most people probably don't even think about that. If, if you're male and you're going in and getting testing for potential prostate cancer, you're probably thinking maybe your son, but your daughter, you could, you could also um, give some very valuable information uh, for her as well. So that's, that's great information. So uh, what is the process for, for getting genetic testing? If I want to do this, what would I do and, and how, how do I go about it? Well, we do recommend if you, uh, you know, to come in for an appointment to talk about it in more detail. Uh, we also recommend kind of talking to your family members ahead of time. It's really important to get a good family history, so um, gathering as much information as you can um, about the ages that individuals are diagnosed, the specific types of cancer, um, helps us kind of decide what genetic test we might order. Um, we tend to do kind of broader genetic testing these days where we're not testing just prostate cancer genes, but like we've, we've said, we test genes that can also increase the risk of other cancers. Um, but having a better idea of what cancers are going on in the family helps us then to make uh, management and screening recommendations after the genetic test results are back because uh, even if genetic testing is negative, we still may actually change how we manage um, individuals in the family, particularly if there's a strong family history of prostate cancer, then we still treat people as high risk for prostate cancer, even in the context, context of negative testing. So family history is important, uh, but like I mentioned, it's just actually a, a blood draw. We can take one tube of blood and test as many as 80 genes at the same time. Wow. That's, that's very interesting. So you talked a little bit about the, about the high risk and advanced prostate cancer clinic, our new clinic. How long has that been in existence? Yes. Yeah, we've been going for about six months, six months yeah. and there's many of us that staff that clinic, and it's really two distinct populations that we offer it to. One is the man who might be at high risk of developing prostate cancer based on ancestry or family history or an identifiable genetic mutation, and then completely separate but often overlapping are a group of men newly diagnosed with a type of prostate cancer that has a legitimate threat of either spreading to other parts of the body or it already has spread to other parts of the body. And we're really proud of the fact that we have a lot of really new innovative uh, clinical trials and screening protocols to offer these men. And obviously one of our goals at any academic center is to provide top-notch cutting edge care, but to also move the needle and come up with newer, better ways of treating these men. Yeah, and you know, again, we were talking in the first segment, just the, the fact that we do have so many options available here, we, we do the clinical trials here as well, just a huge benefit to the patient. So I think, you know, probably if we want to leave somebody with a thought, because we are just about out of time, and I know men don't want to go talk to the doctor about prostate cancer, that's 
an uncomfortable conversation to have, but it's a good thing to, to see your physician on a regular basis, get your checkups, that sort of thing, and if you have a concern this, in this area, obviously, you want to talk about it. Um, you guys were great. Thanks for having us. Thank we you. appreciate you being on. That's all the time we have for At the Forefront Live. I want to thank our viewers for their great questions today. If you want more information about some of the health topics that we discussed on today's program, please visit our website at uchicagomedicine.org or you can call 888-824-0200. And please make sure to check out our Facebook page for future At the Forefront Live dates and subjects. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.